What is up guys, this is the Awesome Nerd Show bringing you another Monday Night Rewind podcast. We go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and cover Raw and Nitro from 1998. And so this week we are looking at January 12th, 1998. And we're covering Raw 242 and Nitro 122. And so as usual we'll start with Raw and move on to Nitro so this week, um, Raw is, I'd say, kind of a big show. It's not like anything big, but with the stuff they're preparing for, it's kind of big. And so um, Raw ends up drawing a 3.46 rating, so it's still rising up and increasing. And it took place at Penn State University, so at, like, a, I assume, an arena, or, like basketball arena or something at Penn State. And so the show ends up opening, like, as soon as the show starts, it has DX in a limo, so it's just like a camera inside the limo and DX, you know, sitting in the back of the limo. And and they're talking to the camera and stuff, and so they end up cutting a promo on Owen Hart, pretty much Triple H does, and The Undertaker from Shawn Michael. And Shawn Michaels eventually ends up uh, pulling his pants down and revealing his butt, and then he like sticks it up through the um, sunroof, or he like climbs up through the sunroof to where his butt's sticking out and stuff and yelling at people because they're obviously at Penn State so they're at a university and stuff and so they're yelling for college girls and stuff like that so trying to you know continue on with their sexual nature stuff so then we go into the actual open other show and then as it opens it's mentioned that this is the fifth anniversary of Raw so I think Raw started on January 11th maybe in 93 and so one day off for me in the fifth an- year anniversary so that's one reason why it's big and then we also have the 90 Royal Rumble on Sunday so we're finishing up all the stuff preparing for the Royal Rumble on Sunday so the show starts off with a match a four-way tag team match of the Outlaws versus the Headbangers versus the Godwins versus the Truth Commission so as the, the Outlaws are coming out it's shown or mentioned whatever they pointed out that they're wearing Florida Gator shirts and so they just uh keep talking crap for some sports thing I don't know if it was basketball football or I don't know exactly what's uh going on for sure at this point in time but they're talking apparently the gate Florida Gators had recently beat the Penn State team or whatever and so that's why they're wearing the shirt and so the crowd just kept chanting at them throughout the whole show and stuff or throughout the whole match Penn State chants or whatever and stuff but as they get in the ring the truth commission start both so the two guys from the teams the truth commission guys start beating up on Billy Gunn and the headbangers start beating up on Road Dog, and so the Godwins are just standing in their corner of the ring on the outside just watching this go on but eventually the match actually starts and then once the Godwins end up getting tagged in because obviously it's a tag match so you can't tag your own partner but you can tag any other people from the thing or whatever of the teams and stuff and so the Godwins eventually end up getting tagged in and they pretty much just dominate the match the whole time there and there until the very end where Billy Gunn with the whole distraction stuff going on ends up pulling a foreign object out of his pants and hitting Phineas with it and gets the pin on him for that so the outlaws end up winning there and fittingly we then go into a video package of the LOD and it's all talking about uh, you know their history in the WWF and then their return or that they're returning at the Royal Rumble and they're going to be facing the New Age Outlaws for the tag team title so that's going to be our tag team match for the Royal Rumble. Then next we go to a camera that's in like the back, uh, like kind of like parking lot area or whatever, the building, the entrance area. And it come to her mentions that they're uh, waiting for the DX limo to arrive and stuff. But as it's sitting there watching it, Stone Cold comes pulling in with his truck and drives crazily or whatever into the building and everything. Then it goes to commercial and comes back and they say like during the commercial break this happens and the camera's picked it up. And it shows that Stone Cold had uh, beat up the Godwins in the back. So apparently they were somewhere along his his way to wherever he's going which we'll see here in a second but he came along the godwins and just decided to beat both of them up so then that goes into michael cole calling stone cold out to be like for an interview and stuff and stone cold drives his truck into the arena so again they're also trying to do the whole sell on this truck because they're giving it away or something there's like a thing you can do to win the truck and so they're i guess trying to show it as much as i can so he drives it into the arena and he talks about how the attacks that he's been doing on people will continue because he wants to get to them first before they can get to him and that anyone that enters the ring during the Royal Rumble, he's going to kick their ass and send them over the top rope. So he's just laying down, you know, that he's going to be the dominant guy in the match and stuff, which we will see. Um, but he's just setting that all up and stuff that he's there. To, he's not going to take anything from nobody. And then he asks Michael Cole for a marker and Mar- Michael Cole, for some reason, has one or something. And he uh, hands it to him. Stone Cold uh, takes and draws a circle on his chest and stuff, mentioning that this will be the target that everyone's coming for. And that anyone that wants a pizza him 
can come out and get the shit kicked out of him tonight. And so he's just setting up being dominating in the Royal Rumble and just that he's not going to take shit from nobody. We then go back to the camera in the parking lot and this time uh, we see the limo arriving and they start to dry, try like drive into the building. But there's like turns around and there's a truck sitting in like the entrance area like blocking it and so the, you know they're trying to get in so sean ends up getting out and goes up to the truck and starts yelling at i guess whoever is around or whatever to get the truck to move and everything so we leave it to there and go back to the ring where we have kurgan coming out with the jackal and he's taking on just two like jobber guys or enhancement talents or whatever i don't even remember what their names were but they attack Kurgan as soon as he enters the ring, but he's, of course, able to get a handle on him and dominate him and stuff. And Kurgan ends up sitting one guy up on top on the top turnbuckle, and he goes outside and, like, on the ground and just grabs a hold of his legs and is just pulling him down. So he's, like, crotching the guy on the top turnbuckle area, just, like, pulling his legs, pulling his crotch, you know, into the turnbuckle. And the guy's yelling and screaming and everything. But he gets back in the ring and he ends up putting the claw on one of the guys and uh, holds him down and gets the pin on it. And then he picks uh, one of the guys up, body slams the other guy, then takes the first guy and grabs him, drags him over, puts him on top of the guy he body slammed, and then puts his foot on both of them and gets the pin on both. Then next up, we go back to the outside where Sean's still yelling at the truck driver and it shows an actual guy there that he's yelling at and stuff. But as he's doing it, Own Heart ends up sneaking around the opposite side of the truck or something or behind Sean where he doesn't see him and climbs over like the roof of the vehicle and goes through the sunroof inside the limo and just starts attacking Triple H. So we go to back into the uh, camera inside the limo and it's showing and beating him up. And so apparently China was outside as well with Sean, which she, she didn't get out at first, but it did. She was out with him when he, uh, he was yelling at the guy and stuff. It showed, and so they can hear that something's going on. So they go back. I think Sean ends up going through the sunroof also, but China ends up running to the back door and opening it and uh, jumps in. And so they all jump in the limo, and the limo starts backing out of the drive and takes off. Then back to the ring, we got a match of Mark Marrow taking on Vader. So as Mark Marrow gets in the ring, he grabs a microphone and starts talking, but there's an issue, so he's just talking and no one can hear what he's saying or anything. But they end up, it's assumed or whatever, that he's introducing somebody because someone comes out, and he uh, then gets a microphone that works or it starts working or something, and he just re-says the stuff all over. But he's introducing Sable to come out, and so Sable ends up coming out, but instead it's Gold Dust dressed as Sable. And so he has a, a blonde wig on and is in a very revealing outfit. It's kind of like a bikini or something. So we get to see a lot of Gold Dust that we normally wouldn't see or want to see and stuff, so it was kind of weird in that sense. But as the match goes on, invaders come out and everything, the match is going on, and at one point Gold Dust ends up tripping Vader. So as usually people do when there's someone on the outside, they grab the foot and trip up the person. And and after doing that, uh, Sable ends up coming out. And, of course, the crowd just goes berserk when she comes out. And she ends up coming down and starts yelling at Goldust and stuff. And she ends up kicking him and stuff and just trying. I think Commentary mentions that uh, she wants him to stop, you know, dressing like her and stuff, whatever. But upon noticing this, Meryl gets out of the ring and he goes over to Sable and just starts yelling at her and stuff. And telling her to get to the back. And he eventually just sends her off to the back and she goes. And when he gets back in the ring, Vader attacks him and beats him up or whatever and vader's able to go up and hit a vader bomb onto him but as he's going for the pin on mara goldust comes in and pulls a coconut out of his bra and hits vader in the back of the head with it so because of that vader gets the win by disqualification and goldust goes down and i believe both marrow and goldust leave definitely goldust because you know doesn't want to get caught by vader after doing that so they end up leaving the ring leaving vader who then eventually starts to get up then we go back to the camera outside where the limo comes driving back into the arena and uh, it just shows DX getting out and stuff and they're acting, you know, all calm and casual and everything. And so commentary poses that, where's Owen Hart? You know, what happened to him? And then we go to the back locker room where we have a camera showing that Stone Cold had attacked Vader in the locker room in the back or whatever. So continuing to beat up on different people. And then we move on to a match of The Rock and D'Lo from The Nation of Domination taking on Ken Shamrock and Mark Henry. So as Mark Henry comes out, it's shown that he's wearing a shirt that says Rocky sucks. And so as soon as he gets in the ring, The Rock 
Gar grabs a microphone and he starts cutting a promo on Mark Henry and stuff and about wearing the shirt, tell him to take it off. And then he turns and starts talking crap about the sports teams in uh, Philadelphia and stuff like that. But in the match, Ken Shamrock ends up at one point hitting a Hurricane Rana on the rock and has followed it up by a belly-to-belly -belly suplex. And then Shamrock starts to go to a apply the ankle lock and grabs a hold of it. But as he does, Mark Henry comes in and clotheslines him. So this is Mark Henry turning on Ken Shamrock. And so Henry and the Nation just start beating up on Shamrock. So this is the introduction of Mark Henry into the Nation of Domination. And when they're done beating up Shamrock, the Rock goes over and tears off Mark Henry's shirt. And he has a Nation of Domination shirt on underneath it, you know, showing that he's joined them. And then they start to leave the ring and walk up the ramp. And Farouk has come out onto the entrance ramp and... Uh, He's acting all angry and has a look on his face and stuff. And The Rock's like, no, like he's a present for you. I did this for you and all sorts of stuff, adding Mark Henry to the group. So he's just trying to play it off that, you know, he just added more strength into their team and stuff. Then after some commercials, we come back and Michael Cole is interviewing the nation in the locker room. And The Rock just talking about how they added Mark Henry and it was just all for Farouk. And that Farouk needs to calm down and all sorts of stuff. And that's all pretty much that was said there. And that leads us into hour number two, and it has, starts off with DX coming out for a promo. And uh, they come out and just talk about how Owen got beat up, and they flushed him down a sewer like the nugget he is. So again, continue on calling him the nugget, the piece of poop. And Triple H then moves on and starts uh, making fun of Mike Tyson's voice, mentioning, you know, because Mike Tyson's going to be coming in and stuff. And Sean gets on the mic and talks about how if Tyson gets involved or anything in his match at the Royal Rumble, Sean's going to dance all over his face, of course, you know, just trying to talk big for Mike Tyson and show that he doesn't fear him or anything. And soon after that, we then get someone yelling on the Titantron and it shows that it's Owen Hart. And it shows he's all like beat up. He's got like some blood on his face or something. And he's talking about uh, that he survived their beating and stuff. And so Triple H gets on mic and uh, challenge him to come out and so Owen then does and he comes out on the like a crutch or something so I guess trying to show that he was beat up and stuff more along with the blood on his face and when he starts to come out Triple H starts to head up the ramp towards Owen but referees come out and get in between them and start se and separate the two and stuff so they can't ever get to each other and that leads into our next match of Skull and 8-Ball from the DOA taking on the Rock and Roll Express, of course, because Jim Cornette has brought the NWA to WWF now, and so some of the people he brought with the Rock and Roll Express. And so, of course, Jim Cornette comes out and introduces them, and it's mentioned that uh, Jeff Jarrett couldn't be there tonight because he was supposed to have the match or defend the title against somebody. I can't remember if they said it or anything. But he's supposed to defend it, but there's a family illness or something that he had to attend to and couldn't be there. But throughout the match at one point, Jim Cornette ends up running in and hits the DOA with a racket to break up a pinfall. And he's just standing there looking at the DOA guy and stuff. And the ref turns around and notices it. And so, uh, like, notices Jim Cornette standing there with the racket and everything. So the DOA ends up getting the win by disqualification. And 8-Ball ends up coming in and grabs a hold of Cornette and uh, starts to attack him and stuff until Ricky Morton ends up coming in and hitting 8-Ball with the racket. So both of the DOA members have been hit with the racket now. And uh, Jim Cornette and the Rock and Roll Express are just outnumbering the DOA with, you know, three on two beating him up and everything and then chains ends up running out and Cornette and the Rock and Roll Express end up escaping the ring and running out. Then next up, we have a little video package or footage or whatever of Mick Foley, and he's on the field of some football stadium. I assume it's the Penn State Stadium, but it didn't say or sh there was no hints or anything. But he's just on the field, and he doesn't have shoes on or anything, so I don't know what was going on. But he's just talking about his history with Terry Funk and Terry Funk being his kind of like inspiration or mentor and stuff like that, and then how he decided to call on him to be a partner for him, and that the New Age Outlaws will pay for their crimes in a what he's calling a brutal bowl instead of like super bowl or battle bowl or something like that and so i guess kind of lean up i'm not sure if they have them no they don't have a match because yeah that's right new age outlaws has a match with lelo d um but just kind of help building up more for their feud the next up, we get a match between Mankind and Goldust. And, of course, Goldust comes out with Luna. And as they're coming out, Goldust ends up coming out. And he's dressed as Dude Love. And so he comes out to Dude Love's music and everything. But very early on in the match, Mankind's able to get the Mandible Claw put on Goldust. And as he stands there holding it on him or whatever, waiting for him to tap out or submit or whatever happens with the Mandible Claw, uh, Stone Cold ends up comes running in and he hits a stunner on Mankind and then he hits a stunner on Goldust. So again, just tacking more people throughout the night. And then he runs over and goes over to the commentary table and pulls JR's headphones off and puts them on and talks into the mic saying that uh, he's just going to win, that he's ready to win the Royal Rumble. 
Then next up, we have a JR interviewing Vince McMahon about the whole Mike Tyson situation and stuff that's going on. And Vince mentions that negotiations are not complete yet, but he will be at the Royal Rumble. And that Mike Tyson will be on Raw next week to announce if anything has been finalized. So, of course, setting up for next week, you know, Mike Tyson's going to be there and stuff. And it does kind of pay off for him and everything. Then next up, we get the match of Savio Vega and Jesus from the Los Briquas taking on Takamichi Noku and Scott Taylor. So two, what I guess are considered heavyweight guys taking on some light heavyweight guys. Um, but Sunny introduces the match and she's dressed as in like a cheerleader outfit and stuff. So I guess kind of continue on to try and push sales and stuff for that swimsuit edition of the Raw magazine or whatever, showing her in skimpy clothes. But at one point in the match, Taka ends up hitting a moonsault off the top rope onto Savio Vega on the floor, but Savio ends up catching him and then power slams him down onto the ground. And then back inside the ring, Jesus ends up reverse suplexing Scott Taylor off the top rope. Like it's very weird. Like it's a cool looking move, but it's weird at the same time the way he does it. It's just weird off the top rope and stuff. Um, but like I said, it looked really cool. But in, off of that, he's able to get the pin. So the low spreak was win there. And then all the break was, or the other two break was come in and they all just start beating up on both the guys until Owen Hart comes running out and fights the break was off with the crutch. And of course, he's trying to get back in them because of the last week, I think it was, or something. The DX had paid Bre- the break was to beat up on Owen and stuff and delivered him to Triple H and everything. And so he's trying to get back at him for that. Then next up, we have Michael Cole interviewing DX in the ring. So, of course, DX comes out or whatever. And they're talking and saying that uh, the DX has greeted Kane with open arms and they are ready to accept him into the family. So, they're talking about, you know, how Kane left Paul Bear and everything last week. Or Paul Bear mentioned that Kane left him. And so, they're like, we're here waiting for you, Kane. You can join DX whenever you want. And so, Sean ends up calling for Kane to come out to join him. But instead, the Undertaker's music plays and he comes out instead to confront Shawn Michaels. Of course, preparing for their match at Royal Rumble. And Undertaker ends up telling Sean uh, to leave his family alone. And you need to worry about the match at the Royal Rumble instead of Kane. And eventually this leads to, of course, a confrontation. So Undertaker ends up choking Shawn Michaels back into a corner. And China comes up and tries to attack Undertaker from behind. But Undertaker, like, turns and notices her. And so Undertaker gets uh, grabs a hold of China with the choke. And ends up picking her up and start to go for a choke slam. But he's just holding her up in the air, which looked really cool and stuff. But Triple H comes in from behind and hits Undertaker with the crutch, which allows him to drop China or whatever. And then Undertaker starts to go for Triple H and is backing him into the corner until Shawn Michaels comes up from behind and turns Taker around and hits him with a sweet chin music. And so that allows DX to all team up and beat up on the Undertaker and stuff until Kane comes out and starts attacking DX and ends up chasing them off out of the ring into the back. And then Kane and Undertaker just kind of stare down at each other. Kane leaves and goes up to the top of the ramp, turns around, and then Kane just stands there and sticks his hand out, kind of like the thing the Undertaker does. And then in the ring, Undertaker does what people call the Shakespeare, where he gets down on one knee and does his hand gesture that Kane was doing. And they're just kind of doing it to each other. And it mentioned, you know, that they're uh, kind of like getting along or like having a handshake agreement type thing, whatever, to help each other and stuff. And as... uh, undertaker does that the fire on the ring post or kane's fire pyro goes off on the ring post and stuff and that leads into our last segment of the night which is the drawing for the royal rumble numbers and so it just kind of all shows all sorts of people coming out so it shows ken shamrock coming out and as soon as he gets in the ring he just starts attacking mark henry and that'll start causes everyone to start fighting with each other I thought it was a funny addition, but Honky Talk Mans ends up coming out, so apparently he's going to be in the Royal Rumble. We then get Stone Cold coming in from behind, so uh, I think his music plays and everyone's like looking up at the ramp, but he ends up coming in from behind through the crowd, and he gets in and he hits someone with the number tumbler. I think it was like Phineas Godwin or something, I don't know exactly who, but he picks up because they have like the big gold like tumbler thing that has all sorts of numbers that they draw out. He ends up picking it up and hitting it someone in the back and then gets out of the ring and runs out. And, of course, that caused everyone to just start fighting in the ring. And Austin starts to leave up the ramp. And as he, like, gets towards the top of the ramp or as, just as he makes it through the curtains or whatever, he ends up getting knocked. If he goes through the curtain, he gets knocked back out. Or if he gets to the top, they come out and attack him. But he gets starting getting beat up by The Rock, D'Lo, and Savio Vega. So I don't know why Savio was in there with him. Like, I know he was a part of the nation and stuff. But you have Rock and D'Lo from the nation and then just Savio. I don't know why it wasn't another nation member or something. But they just start beating up on Stone Cold. Cold. and so we got everyone fighting in the ring and then those four guys or three guys beating up on stone cold being the fourth guy um up on the ramp and everything and that's how the show ends so that was a 
a pretty decent show together. I liked it. they kept going back to the whole uh, DX thing with the limo and stuff, and then Stone Cold beating up everybody and attacking them again before he can beat or they before they can attack him, and just building up for the Royal Rumble on Sunday, which I love Royal Rumbles, and the '98 one was pretty good and stuff. But uh, so they're just all building up to that. So that's why it was kind of like a big good show, and it's just raw and attitude era. And to me, it's just some of the best, most entertaining stuff there is. Yeah, all, not all the matches are the best. But it's just so entertaining, everything else to me. So I just love it. That's why I do this whole review thing. And so then that will lead us into Nitro. And this week we're looking at Nitro number 122. And it, again, took place from January 12, 1998. It took place in Jacksonville, Florida. And drew a 4.5 rating. So the rating has went back up now. And the show ends up kicking off with a replay of from last week's very first Thunder. So again, on Thursday night last week, we had the very first episode of Thunder. So just kind of replaying stuff that went on there. And it shows the whole events of J.J. Dillon in the ring having Sting hand over the title because um, he's saying after they reviewed the footage, so if you remember last week, they kept talking about all this footage and stuff having to be reviewed and everything. And he says after reviewing the footage, nothing's really clear. So instead of uh, declaring one person or the other the winner, that they're just going to have to hold up the titles until it can be settled or whatever. And so Sting ends up giving him the JJ the title. And he gets in JJ's face saying that you have no guts and you're a coward. And then looks over at Hogan and saying, Hogan, you're a dead man. And so this is like the build to the first time or that was the build to the first time Sting has talked since he uh, switched and went rogue or whatever and uh, became the whole Crow Sting stuff. And so then we go into the uh, this actual start of the show, and it has Mean Gene standing outside waiting to interview members of the NWO as limos pull up, and uh, Kevin Nash ends up coming up to him and saying that he did what he did last week to put out a flame in the NWO, and it was, of course, talking, referencing the whole thing with Macho Man, and then after they move past Gene, start walking, you know, into the building, whatever, Gene mentions that there's no, ma notices that there's no Macho Man with him, and some of the other NWO members aren't there as well. So we then go into our first match of the night, and it's some guy named Jerry Flynn, which kind of looked familiar, but I don't know who he is or if he was anybody, but he's taking on Goldberg. So when Goldberg comes out, there's a very loud crowd reaction for Goldberg, which I was surprised that, you know, this early on he had this sort of reaction, but yeah, the crowd just went crazy when Goldberg came out. But as soon as Goldberg gets into the ring, Flynn starts attacking him. And I notice, like, Flynn, which of course has a mullet, he's just doing some different moves. Like, I was I was like, this is kind of new and different. But he's, they mentioned the commentary does that he's, like, got M and MMA background or something like that. And so it's kind of weird because both guys just start trying to put MMA holds on each other. So the guy takes Goldberg down and uh, starts trying to put, like, you know, a leg submission type. Thing. I don't know what you call it, but, you know, trying to, like... Dislo or bend his leg the opposite way and stuff. Well, Goldberg grabs his leg and starts doing it and gets the upper hand from it and stuff. And they just keep going back and forth with different moves and like arm bars and stuff like that. But eventually, Goldberg's able to hit a spear off on him and then picks him up and hits the jackhammer for the win, continuing on his winning streak. We then get our first Nitro Girls dance segment of the night, and it is mentioned that there is a new Nitro Girl and it shows her and stuff, but I don't remember what her name was or anything. But then we go to the next match of some guy named Black Cat, which I had no clue who he was, but they mentioned something about him that I'll say here in a second. And he's taking on Marty Jannetty. So we got Marty Jannetty in WCW, which is kind of weird. And he's still dressed in his older outfits like he was in WWF with when he like teamed with the new Rockers or whatever with who is Al Snow. So it's just kind of weird, but they have a match, and it's mentioned that Black Cat has trained a lot of New Japan stars, so of course this is back in the night, and they mention names, and they say like Chono and stuff, which of course is a part of the NWO and everything. But they just mentioned that he's a trainer for New Japan, and has and they named a bunch of stars, which I've heard of a bunch of, but I just can't remember them right now. Um, but I know one thing kind of funny is that at one point in the match, Marty ends up hitting a super kick, so he's kind of you know taking Shawn Michaels' move there. Um, then at one point, Black Cat ends up hitting a nasty looking DDT. It looked really cool, but not didn't look very good for Marty. But uh, Marty ends up getting the win, though, with the showstopper, as he's calling it. But it's just um, the new name for the rocker dropper. And so he gets the win on Black Cat with that. And again, this is another week where we have Mean Gene on a lot. So he's out here again to interview the remaining NWO members because he's still outside waiting. And this time, out of a limo comes Macho Man, Scott Hall, and then Tenzon, which is another New Japan wrestler, but I've never noticed him with them before. But um, those are the three that get out, and I oh, Miss Elizabeth as well. 
And so Mean Gene asks him about issues in the NWO, and Macho says, What are you talking about? Three or none? And stuff. I just thought it was funny the way he said it. Then Mean Gene ends up mentioning that uh, Nash had said something about Macho, and Macho just starts going crazy saying, What do you say? What did Nash say about me? And just keeps doing it. And Gene's like, I'm not going to. He's like, I'm going to beat you up and stuff. And it's just funny the way he's threatening Mean Gene all night. And we go back inside to a match of Dean Malenko taking on Chris Benoit. And so this match is kind of surprising because with those two, I'm like, Oh, this is going to be a pretty good match. But it, it wasn't bad, but it was just super slow. Like, they were moving so slow. And they had a lot of good maneuvers, but they were just, like, holds and stuff. And so it was really slow. But at one point in the match, both guys started to go for their finishers multiple different times. And they each just keep countering each other. Of course, these guys, you know, have been facing each other for a long time. So they know each other's moves and everything and know how to counter them. But Benoit eventually ends up catching Dean Malenko with the cross face and is holding that onto him. And I think Benoit wins, or maybe he's just holding the cross face. I don't remember. But Raven and the flock come in and start attacking Chris Benoit. And Raven ends up hitting a DDT on Benoit. And Saturn ends up coming in. And he grabs Dean Malenko and puts the rings of Saturn on him. And so they're both just getting beat up there by the flock. And that leads into another Mean Gene interview, and this time he's talking to J.J. Dillon. And Gene just questions J.J. Dillon about the decision on Lex Luger, which at this point in time I had no clue what they were talking about. And they play some footage of stuff that happened, which didn't really paint a clear picture of what was going on. So I was kind of confused on everything. But I think most of this stuff was from uh, Thunder. But Lex, in, I guess, ended up getting fined because he hit Macho Man with a chair. And so, again, with the announcement from Nick Lambros, the vice president or whatever he's called, um, that I mentioned last week, that there's going to be more fines on guys and stuff. Um, that's one of the fines was because Lex hit Macho with a chair. And JJ mentions that after seeing the footage from last week, that Macho Man will be fined $500 for hitting Eric Bischoff. Of course, that was from Nitro, where Macho tried to hit Le uh, Lex Luger with the chair, but Eric pulled the chair away from him, and Macho turned around and hit Eric Bischoff. And so as soon as JJ announces there's going to be a fight and stuff, Macho Man comes running out and just starts yelling at JJ and stuff. And Bischoff ends up coming out soon after him and he's trying to just calm Macho Man down. And he's saying, you know, I'll pay for the fine. Don't worry. Don't worry about stuff. I'll just pay for it. And Macho mentions, you know, it's not about the money. It's the principle and stuff. And then he turns to Gene, just starts yelling at Gene, asking what Nash said about him and stuff, continuing on with that. We go to a commercial and come back, and this time we have Mean Gene interviewing DDP. And, of course, as uh, DDP comes out, the crowd goes crazy for him, too. So we got DDP and Goldberg being two very popular people now in WCW besides the NWO and stuff. And at one point, DDP mentions, of course, he's just talking about random stuff, but he mentions that this week on Thunder, that there's going to be a match of him and Luger taking on Macho Man and Kevin Nash. So he's, like, uh, uh, mentioning, you know, apparently Macho Man and Kevin Nash need to work out their issues, but apparently the NWO isn't for life. And he says uh, that apparently Macho Man and Miss Elizabeth isn't for life either. Of course, making a comment about their divorce and stuff like that. And as soon as he says that, Mean Gene says, like, oh, we can't talk about that on TV and stuff like that. And then uh, he talks a little bit more, but in the end, saying that Macho and Nash will feel the bang. So ending off with his little catchphrase there. Then next up, we get a match of Perry Saturn taking on Booker T. And so in the match, Saturn, at one point, Saturn ends up tossing Booker T across the ring with a pump handle suplex. So he, like, picked him up and just tossed him across the ring. I was surprised, you know, because Saturn's and size at least much smaller than Booker T. So it was just kind of fun to see that. But throughout the match, Booker just dominates the majority of it. Obviously, Saturn gets some stuff in, but not nearly as much as Booker T does. But Saturn does end up getting the win with a roll-up, but he's got his feet on the rope, and so it's announced that he's the new TV champion because the ref didn't notice the feet on the ropes and stuff. But for some reason, Rick Martel ends up running out, and he comes out to the ring and starts talking to the ref and stuff about Saturn's feet and stuff, so the ref ends up restarting the match. And soon after he does, Booker T ends up hitting the scissor kick, followed by the Harlem hangover on Saturn to get the win. And so as Booker T's walking out, he walks by Martel and stuff, and he's thanking Martel. And Martel's like, well, you can thank me by giving me a shot at the title. And Booker T says, you know what? You got it and stuff. So they're obviously setting up for the match. Then next up, we get Mean Gene introducing Nick Lambros and the Giant out to the ring and stuff. 
that there's some sort of thing going on. And so they come out and Nick Lambros just starts talking. He mentions that Kevin Nash has yet to give a good excuse for the reason why he missed Starcade last month. You know, their biggest pay-per-view ever. And Kevin Nash couldn't even show up to it and stuff. And so he's being saying, you know, he hasn't given us a good reason. So for that reason, the NWO must pay a $1.5 million performance bond. Guaranteeing that Kevin Nash will either fate be in the match against the Giant and will show up for it. Or he will be suspended for one year. And so by that, Nash will have to face Giant at Sold Out, which is their next pay-per-view. So it's guaranteeing that that match will happen. And then he also adds on that, do the stuff coming down from uh, Turner or whatever and stuff, that Eric Bischoff is being cut off from Turner's money so he can no longer use the money to do whatever he wants and just rack up a huge bill and everything. And so, of course, that pushes the in the, or makes the NWO mad stuff or whatever. So Eric Bischoff, Hulk Hogan, and Kevin Nash end up all coming out to the ring. And then I'm coming out with another guy who, once they get in the ring, they announce is who's being called the attorney to the stars, um, Henry Holmes. And so it's announced that they accept the $1.5 million performance bond and that Hogan is going to be paying for the bond. But for them to agree to it and everything, the WCW must do the same in return, saying that, you know, WCW must pay the bond. And with that, that the Giant is not allowed to touch Kevin Nash until their match is sold out. Or if he does, the um, Nash won't have to be in the match and that they'll get paid the $1.5 million instead. And so WCW agrees that the Giant does and stuff. And so as soon as he does, Nash just starts getting up in the Giant's face and stuff, trying to provoke him. And he's, you know, making fun of him, calling him names and stuff, trying to get Giant to lay a hand on. But Giant's just standing there looking at him. We then get go to a video package on Lex Luger and Macho Man just talking about their history or whatever, leading up to their match at Sold Out. And that goes into hour number two, and it kicks off with Hugh Morris taking on Lex Luger. It's not a long match, but Luger ends up getting the win with the torture rack on Hugh Morris. And as soon as he wins, Miss Elizabeth ends up running out to the ring, and she's just begging for Luger for help for something. I don't know why. And so they start to walk towards the back, and as soon as they get to like the um, ramp up from the aisleway, Macho Man attacks Lex Luger from behind. It just starts beating him up until DDP comes running out and that causes Macho Man and Elizabeth to go running off. Then next up we get a Nitro Girls dancing with a Nitro Party commercial and stuff. And then uh, then we go to commentary and they bring up that there have been issues between the Steiner brothers. Talking about how Scott's being like selfish or whatever and that he wants to get the pin in all the matches and finish off the guys and stuff. Just wanting to be the one to win all the time and everything so it's kind of building up the tensions preparing for later on for the breakup of the steiner brothers then we go to the match of chris jericho taking on steve mongo mcmichaels so in the match mongo's just overpowering chris jericho all the time but at one point jericho ends up hitting a what they call super frankensteiner off the top rope which sends mongo flying across the to the other side of the ring but in the end, Mongo ends up catching Jericho with the Tombstone Piledriver and gets the win off that and just leaves Chris Jericho laying in the ring. So it goes to the commercial and comes back and we have Chris Jericho in the ring still and he's on the microphone and he's just throwing a tantrum on the mic and stuff and he's just yelling at the crowd and stuff just like calling them all different names and everything and you know saying that i thought you people looked up to me and all this sort of stuff and then he just turned around and uh kind of looks at the camera and you hear commentary which i don't know how he would have heard him but the commentary knows uh jericho we're on back on live or something like that and as soon as like jericho you know looks into the camera stuff he's like kind of like switches the look on his face and stuff and he's um has puts a smile on and he's like I, you know, I have shown here tonight that I can lose with dignity and stay a role model for all you, for all you fans and stuff. And that I'm sorry and it will never happen again. So he's just trying to act all like, you know, nice and happy and everything. And he's just going on and stuff about him losing all the time and everything. And so Rey Mysterio's music starts playing and Rey Mysterio comes out and he gets in the ring. He's just kind of like, look, talking to Jericho or whatever. And Jericho's like, what are you doing? I was conducting an interview. I had the people in the palm of my hand. And all sorts of stuff. He's just being real funny and a character. This is really good Chris Jericho at this point. And he's then like I guess comes with sense of whatever. He's like you know what I'm sorry Ray. And he's like you know what you have a great match. You're, you know you're one of my favorite cruiserweights. And he starts to leave and stuff. And so Ray's doing whatever in the ring. And Jericho comes up and attacks him from behind. And just starts hitting a bunch of backbreakers on him. And then puts him into the lion tamer and stuff. 
And he's doing that, and Hooventude ends up coming, music starts playing, and he comes out. And uh, pretty much as soon as he gets into the ring, Chris Jericho gets out of the ring and leaves. And it's kind of funny, when Hooventude comes into the ring or whatever, he tries to like, springboard in, but his feet catch on the top rope, so he just kind of crashes into the ring and stuff, and it's kind of funny. But like I said, Jericho had gotten out of the ring and was leaving at this point. And that leads into our next match of Rey Mysterio taking on Juventud Guerrero. But of course, because of what just happened, the ref's trying to like cancel him out, telling Juve it's not going to happen and stuff, and trying to get him off or whatever and stuff. But Juve just runs over and just starts attacking Rey Mysterio. And pretty quickly, Juventud is just dominating Rey because of the injury and stuff, and ends up pulling him over and hitting the 450 splash on him to the, get the win. So Juventud wins the match there. We then get another replay video from Thunder and the whole thing of just JJ holding up the title and everything. Just kind of trying to catch people up on it if they miss the like first hour or something like that. We then have Hogan and Bischoff coming out to the ring to do a promo. And they're talking about how the NWO always plans ahead and that uh, Henry Holm wasn't here by luck. He's our insurance policy for all of the NWO. So it's just talking about, you know, they planned this whole thing. And then they mentioned that Holmes is going to be in federal court fixing this whole mess, which I doubt this is anything that the federal court would want to get involved in. And then Hogan just mentioned, you know, with him being the king in, of whatever of wrestling, making it what it is today, that everyone should be bowing at his feet. And they leave, and then we get an interview of me, of course, me and Gene interviewing uh, Jim Nightheart. So Jim Nightheart is a new member into the WCW at this point, of course, after leaving WWF because of the whole Bret Hart stuff and I guess the NW or WWF tried to like work with Jim Nyhart and stuff, but he didn't think he could trust people and stuff, so he just left for WCW. And so Jim Nyhart just mentions that he can't believe the statements that Ric Flair made about Bret Hart and that Flair isn't the best there is, best there was or ever will be that Bret is. And so of course that causes Flair to come out because it makes him mad and stuff. And he comes out, you know, welcomes Jim to, to WCW and is saying all sorts of nice things about him and everything. And so Flair then turns and challenges Jim to say say it to his face. And so Jim Nyher looks on and says, Brett is the best in the world and stuff. And so Flair is like, you know what? If you're going to say that, we need to fight or whatever. So he challenges him to a fight. Jim Knight hurt. You know, Flair's like, you go to back and get ready and we'll come out and we'll have a match. And he's like, I'm already ready. I have my gear on and everything. And so Flair starts at the back. I, we assumed, you know, to put on his ring outfit and stuff. But he just ends up coming out a short time later, you know, with a suit still on and everything. And he gets in the ring. Then the match starts and Flair just hits Jim Knight hurt with a foreign object of some sort. And then the refs, you know, noticing or whatever. So Ric Flair then hits the ref, knocking him out. And he's just beating him up, up on Jim Nightheart. And Flair ends up pulling Nightheart over to the ring post and goes outside and puts the figure four on him, just like Brett used to do the people on WWF and stuff. And so as Ric Flair's holding that on him and stuff, Brett comes running out and that uh, causes Flair to release the hold. And so Brett just starts chasing Rick around the ring and stuff until Flair ends up running to the back and Brett just gets in the ring and helps out Nightheart. Which we do find out later on during the main event um, that Rick Flair was fine for attacking the ref and everything and Nightheart and stuff. So again, handing out more fines and everything. But that goes into a Nitro Girl segment and then we get a video from a Nitro Party. So somebody's Nitro Party. I couldn't catch really anything on it besides the actual party itself. But any names or where it's from or anything. But we got that video and then that goes into our main event for the night. Which is the Scott Hall and Kevin Nash coming out facing the Steiner Brothers and with Dead DiBiase. And Hall and Nash end up coming out with Hogan. But it's supposed to be like a uh, unif or title unification match because of uh, Hall and Nash having the fake titles and Steiner Brothers having the real titles and everything. But the match is introduced by Michael Buffer. So again being a big main event or whatever when they bring him out. And so before the match starts, Hall has to, of course, survey the crowd. But WCW gets a lot more chance than NWO. But he still says another win for the good guys or something like that. Might gain it for the NWO. And so the Steiners end up coming out. And uh, as soon as they're in the ring and stuff, Scott Steiner ends up challenging Hogan to come into the ring and face him and stuff. But Hogan does or whatever. So the match starts and the Steiners are able to get control in the early part of the match. But eventually at one point, Macho Man comes out and, you know, trying to go over to Nash. But Hogan's staying between him and Nash. And uh, Macho Man, you can hear him just saying that he wants to know what Nash said about him. But Hogan just keeps him, just keeps standing between them. And then at one point, as Hall and Nash start to get the upper hand, Hall ends up hitting the choke slam, And then, of course, starts to mark, mock the giant and stuff, making fun of him, acting like a Frankenstein and stuff. But then at one point, Rick Steiner ends up start going up to the top rope to do a bulldog. 
But Hogan comes over and pulls his foot and so knocks Rick off the top rope. And so that causes Scott Steiner to go out after Hulk Hogan and starts attacking him. And back inside the ring, Hall ends up grabbing a hold of Rick Steiner and holding him up. And Kevin Nash comes in and goes across the ring to hit a big boot. But as he's doing that, Rick Steiner ducks. And Kevin Nash ends up kicking Scott Hall. And Scott Hall at this point ends up falling back onto the referee and knocking him down. And the ref was dealing with Scott Steiner because Scott was trying to come in since they were double teaming Rick and stuff. And so the ref is now knocked out. And then um, from there, Rick Steiner gets the upper hand and starts to go for a pin. But there's no ref to count the pin, so there's no one there. Then we go, chaos kind of starts to happen. And Hogan it shows Hogan outside, and he's just attacking Ted DiBiase and beating him up. And then inside the ring, Kevin Nash comes in and attacks Rick Steiner, like low blows him or something like that, and starts to cover Rick for the pin. But as he's doing that, Macho Man goes up to the turnbuckle closest to him and starts to go up top to deliver the elbow. And as he's like, right as he's jumping off, Mach- Kevin Nash notices and rolls out of the way. So Macho Man just hits the elbow onto Rick Steiner. And Kevin Nash and Scott Hall then both jump on top of Rick Steiner covering him. And the ref counts three, the three. So Hall and Nash are now the unified or undisputed, whatever you want to call it, tag team champions in NWO. And back outside the ring, Hogan's over at Macho Man because once uh, Macho Man hit it on Rick, he rolled out of the ring trying to pretend like it didn't happen or whatever. And Hogan's uh, yelling at Macho Man on the outside and stuff. And Macho Man's like, what are you talking about? They won and stuff like saying like I did it to help him and all sorts of stuff, even though he was clearly going to try and hit Kevin Nash. And then Kevin Nash comes out of the ring and starts going after Macho and Hogan's just trying to hold Kevin Nash back from getting the Macho. And that's where the show ends. So overall, it wasn't a bad episode of Nitro. It's just, for some reason, Rawls go by so fast when watching them, but Nitro's just drag on. But thankfully, this wasn't a, a three-hour. It was a little over, too. Um, but thankfully, like I said, it wasn't a three. It didn't last any longer. But overall, it wasn't that bad of an episode. I definitely give the upper hand the raw. But um, I like the whole building this dissension and stuff in the NWO and issues with that. And then kind of a new twist on things and stuff. Even though I know it's not probably good things, but the whole fines and stuff on people. Um, but like I said, I like the whole NWO, which of course I know eventually leads to the breakup of the whole pack. I remember that from when I was a kid and stuff. And so I'm um, kind of interested to see how that goes. And of course with this match, we have, or the people involved in this match, we have Macho Man and Kevin Nash having issues with each other. And then we didn't really get anything in this match, but uh, the issues between the Steiner brothers that will eventually cause them splitting and everything. But like I said, I definitely give the upper hand of Raw this week over Nitro, but that's usually how things are going to be. But that's it for our episode or reviews this week. Um, So I hope you enjoy these two episodes and stuff as much as I, you know, sort of enjoy them mostly. But don't forget, if you want to support the show, don't forget you can subscribe and leave comments stuff on the videos or podcasts. You, You can find the podcast at Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever you want to call it, and SoundCloud under Monday Night Rewind. And then you can find the videos of the podcast on Awesome Nerd Show channel where you can subscribe there. And leave comments and everything. And that just helps support the channel. And I do want to go announce. I think I've made the final decision. That here in a couple weeks. The podcast is going to change up a little bit. Because once Nitro goes to three hours. I don't have the time to do that. Every single week from here on out. Unfortunately I wish I did. But with work and everything else. For the my YouTube channel and stuff. I don't have time to do that. So I'm probably going to end up switching stuff. Whenever they go to the three hours, which I believe is the end of the month. I can't remember if that's for it for sure, but I'm hope kind of hoping it is with the way things um, lay out and stuff. So that means well, I believe the week or the episode that comes out after what will be the Royal Rumble of this week of, you know, our current year, not the 98 year. That will be the first episode. So we're still going to do the Monday, uh, the Raw episode. So we're still going to do that. So keep it with Raw because Raw, I love watching them and um, they're easier to get through and everything. And so that's, we're still going to keep, you know, the whole Monday Night Rewind since it's more geared towards Raw anyways. So we're still going to do that. So we're going to be the Rewind. And then once we're done with that, we're then going to do hit the fast forward button and come into modern day. And we'll just talk about modern news. So like if it is the episode after the Royal Rumble, we'll talk about the stuff at the Royal Rumble. We'll talk about any other wrestling news that there is, like, important stuff, and we'll just give our opinion because hopefully uh, Bro's going to start joining for that since he actually, you know, knows and stuff about the actual modern day stuff and is not watching these episodes to help me with the podcast now. 
And so he'll be joining in on that. So hopefully you'll be in two conflicting opinions because I, ever since, like, if you can tell by these episodes, that I've been like this since I was a kid, I favor WWF or now E more than anything else. And so I still kind of do that. I do enjoy a lot of different stuff. But my brother or bro, or I don't know, if we'll use, like, his gamer tag name since I use my gamer tag name for most stuff, um, Maverick, or Mav as he likes to go by. He likes everything else, so he was a much bigger WCW fan than I was, so that's why I wanted him to be on this podcast, you know, I would have the raw perspective, he'd be more on the Nitro side, and so we have, like, the clashing things, but it's gonna be the same, where I'm more of a WWE guy, like I said, I know and like a lot of the other extra stuff, but I know mostly and focus mostly on WWE, so I have a much more positive or optimistic outlook on there, where he has more negative looks, so we're going to have conflicting views going on here, so we'll have kind of like arguments or whatever and stuff, so hopefully it'll be much more interesting and stuff, and a much uh, better time to go on for podcasts and stuff like that, and like cut out a whole, you know, watching three hours of another show every week and stuff. So that's going to be it for the podcast this week. I hope you join us when we start the new thing. I'll, like I'll, once obviously it starts, I'll announce when it's getting ready to start and everything. But I want to thank you for watching. Don't forget to follow the podcast or the video podcast version, whatever, on YouTube and iTunes and all that sort of stuff to help me grow and get better at all this stuff and everything. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy and we'll see you next week.